Welcome to an oral history of Cornell's Pizzagate scandal. You may know me as Jordan Anaya or Amnes Rez. Um, if you're familiar with this story, you may just know me as the pizza paper guy. Um, if you're part of the tone police, you may know me as a big meanie. Um, if you care about reproducibility, you may know me as something of a science hero. I like to just think of myself as a vigilante scientist. There's not really that many of us, so I thought I'd share my path to becoming a vigilante scientist. I, I grew up in California, went to UC Berkeley. My family isn't educated. I didn't know what a PhD was. I thought uh, if you liked science, you went to med school, became a doctor, medical doctor. Um, but I quickly learned that the other pre-med students didn't like science very much. So I joined a lab, solved some crystal structures. This led to a publication, um, was a focus of a grad student's PhD thesis. Um, I also graduated, graduated as a finalist for the university medal, if you care about that sort of thing. Um, then I wanted to get some different research experience, so I, I volunteered at a lab in Oakland. Um, the project didn't work out, so I moved across the country to work at the NIH. While at the NIH, I discovered MIT OpenCourseWare, took a couple courses, including the introduction to programming. I literally knew nothing about programming. I didn't know what RAM was, but the the lecture is really good and the I like doing the problem sets so I did the entire course through you through the NIH I I had connections to UVA so I enrolled in their MD PhD program for my PhD I worked on small RNAs specifically um, tRNA fragments when I joined the lab, there wasn't really anyone working on, on the project. There was one grad student who did whatever the PI said, but none of, his, none of his experiments worked. He failed his qualifying exam, and he ended up just leaving the lab when his funding ran out. But because he was a good soldier that never said no, they gave him a master's degree. I also worked on link RNAs specifically novel link RNAs. And to do this, I took advantage of TCGA data. This was actually a collaboration with my friend. And it was actually pretty nice because he knew a lot about link RNAs and RNA-seq. I knew how to program, so it was a good collaboration. This led to a PLOS Medicine paper and was the focus of my friend's uh, PhD thesis. So my work has led to two different PhD theses, but um, I don't have a PhD. Why don't I have a PhD? Well, I wanted to apply TCGA data to the study of small RNAs like I had for link RNAs, but uh, due to lab politics, uh, that wasn't possible. Um, and to be frank, having come from Berkeley and the NIH, the quality of science at UVA didn't really meet my expectations. So since the first day I got there, I thought about leaving. My friends always told me, I'd be crazy to leave without a PhD, but uh, I guess I'm crazy because I ended up just leaving and doing work on my own. I always thought that uh, I could do better work if I didn't have a PI telling me what to do, so I thought, uh, why not see if that's the case? So I became a researcher at large. While at UVA, I was always frustrated by how slowly work was shared. Sometimes you couldn't even tell other, other labs at UVA about, about your research. And the best way to share your work is through the internet. You might have the most amazing code in the world, but if someone can't go to a website and click a few buttons to run that code, it's, it's inaccessible to many people. So the first thing I did was try and learn some, some web development. I didn't know anything about web development, but I Googled 
um, websites with Python. Django came up. There were some good tutorials. I didn't know what HTML was, but I watched some YouTube videos and uh, learned how to make websites. Once I knew how to make websites, I decided to use this knowledge to create Oncolink. I thought there wasn't really a very good tool for doing survival analysis with TCG data. And I guess people agree because Oncolink has been getting 60,000 hits per month for the last several months. I also learned about preprints after leaving UVA and I saw this as the future of science publishing. And I was surprised that there wasn't uh, an index of preprints. So I went ahead and made prepubmed, which, which people seem to like. I then stumbled upon granularity testing and I added the test to a page on prepubmed. And then through a random series of events, um, this led to the Pizzagate scandal. Um, another thing I did when I left UVA was I started reading open science blogs because I didn't know anything about open science and I started blogging myself. And eventually I, I posted enough, enough blog posts that I got recognized as a top writer. Um, blogging takes time, but there, there are side benefits to blogging. You, you meet new people. Um, sometimes journalists will contact me about my blog posts. And the same thing goes for, for Twitter. Twitter takes time, but it's a good way to connect with people and, and have people um, see, see your work. Okay, so what is granularity testing? At its core, granularity testing is very simple. It's a very simple concept. If you have two whole numbers and you add them, and you ask the person to report the result to two decimals, you would be very surprised if they didn't tell you two plus one equals 3.00. You'd be very shocked. But you should be just as shocked no matter what numbers they add. The sum should always end in 0 0.00 because they're whole numbers. A similar thing happens when you, when you calculate averages. If you ask someone to calculate this average, you would be very surprised if they didn't report it as 1.50. But you should be just as surprised if you ask someone to compute the average of two whole numbers. If, if it's not 0 0.50 or 0 0.00, depending on if the sum was odd or even, you should be very surprised by that. And in essence, that's what granularity testing is. If your data is not continuous, the statistics of that data are also not going to be continuous. And some statistics can be reported incorrectly. They are mathematically impossible. You can summarize this pretty easily for, for means, for averages. Um, the average will always be a multiple of 1 over n, n being the sample size. For granularity g, so if your data is not whole numbers but maybe halves or tenths, you just take that granularity, so maybe 1 tenth, and then divide by sample size, and then that would be the granularity of the average. In order for granularity testing to work, the granularity of the statistic must be larger than the granularity of the reported result. So for example, if you have whole numbers, so g of one, sample size of 100, and they report the results to two decimals, so 10 to the negative two, now the granularity of the statistic equals the granularity of the result. So in this case, no matter what they put down, they would pass the test. So when you have two decimals, um, 99 is the highest sample size you can test for averages. And you can uh, write this out as a probability. The failure of passing the test, so you want, you want a high p failure. So if they're just randomly making up numbers, what's the chance of failing the test? It's one minus the sample size 
divided by 10 to the number of decimals the statistic is reported to times the granularity. So you want the sample size to be small. You want the decimals that the stat is reported to to be large, and you want the granularity to be large. But the granularity will most likely be whole numbers. To see how this works, you could have a sample size of 10, a granularity of 1, report to two decimals, which is 1 minus 0.1, which is 90%. So a sample size of 10, two decimals, you have a 90% chance of failing the test if you're randomly making up numbers. And that's summarized in this graph. Um, green is consistent, so a sample size of 1, the only possible mean ends in 0 0.00. As the sample size increases, there's more possibilities. As a result, you have a less chance of, of failing the test. So I did not uh, come up with granularity testing. Nick Brown and James Heathers came up with the test and shared their results as a preprint. Their preprint got some pretty good attention. And, and how come? I mean, this is a pretty simple uh, idea. Well, they actually used the test on 260 recent psychology articles. Um, only 71 of them contained data that could be tested. Of those 71, they found that 36 contained at least one inconsistency. And they saw that 21 had multiple inconsistencies. They emailed the people who had these, they emailed the 21 people who had multiple problems to try and find out what's causing these mathematical errors. Um, one of the most common things is, is typos. So people uh, just mistyped the numbers. Double rounding is actually a pretty serious problem. It's also a problem for my software. So if you have a number like this, it should get rounded to 1.38. But if you have software that rounds to three decimals, and then you subsequently round that a second time, it now gets rounded up to 1.39. This is a pretty pretty big problem for the test, because this is an innocent mistake. Wrong sample sizes, sometimes people will drop subjects and not report it. And then fraud is, is unfortunately always a possibility. Some of the authors did not respond to their emails, and some refused to share their data. When you have mathematical errors, and then the person refuses to share their data, that's, that should be fairly suspicious. And some of the people who wouldn't share their data, they, James Heathers and Nick Brown, suspected they, they could be fabricating their data. Since the publication, they received some more data sets, and the data sets looked suspicious. So this is where I come in. I saw the preprints. I tweeted at the corresponding author. I asked if he wanted a web application for the test. And so I made him one. And it just so happened that he was going to be in Charlottesville right after that for this for this conference. So they posted their preprint on the 23rd. I made a website for them on the 26th. And then on June 8th, I was having barbecue with the corresponding author at my apartment. If that's not, <laughs> if that's not uh, evidence for why you should submit a preprint, I, I don't know. I don't know what it is. So when, when Nick Brown came to Charlottesville. He talked about wanting to extend the test beyond means to other statistics, such as standard deviations. I was also interested in seeing how far you could take granularity testing. Can it be used on standard deviations? What about t-tests, ANOVA tests? So I was pretty interested in this. Um, so I started to look into this problem. This is the formula for standard deviations. We saw that the mean granularity is 1 over n. So what is the standard deviation granularity? 
To try and understand this, I switched to variances. Variance is just the, the square of the standard deviation, so it's a little bit simpler. But I, I couldn't figure out a formula for the granularity of, of variances. So I just started making large tables of values. And I started to notice that numbers were repeating themselves. So here, when you have, for sample size of five, when you have an even integer, this pattern kept on repeating. And then when you had an odd integer, this pattern would repeat. And then at a sample size of six, regardless of whether you had an even or odd integer here, the same pattern repeated. And this this actually holds up for every sample size I've tested above sample size five. So I decided to call this a theorem. If the sample size is even, you'll have this even pattern, which is equal to the odd pattern. If the sample size is odd, the even pattern will not equal the odd pattern. Okay, so I also noticed that the length of the even pattern and the odd pattern, when summed together, they're always a multiple of the sample size. And this holds up all the way to sample size 99, so I decided to call this another theorem. Uh, the length of the full pattern is a multiple of the sample size. So it seems pretty clear something interesting is going on here. We saw that the p failure for means is this, but you may have noticed that the variance granularity is pretty small. So it's going to have a worse p failure. That's a problem. But I, I started to think, if you, if you know that the variance is zero, that means your data has to be the same number repeated, which means that the mean has to end in 0 0.00. So knowing the variance told me what the mean had to end in. So if you know the mean, what the mean ends in, if you know the fractional component of the mean, does that tell you something about the variance? So I started recording the means that match different variances. As expected, a variance of zero has to have means that are whole numbers. And the whole numbers are actually, they, al they also match other variances, but the granularity has now increased. So instead of going from 0 0.0 to 0 0.16, you now jump from zero to 0 0.4 if you know that the, the mean is a, is a whole number. Um, and the means actually show this interesting pattern. So if you have the, the fraction 0.2, um, the, next, the next mean will be 1 minus 0.2. I think that's because if you have a distribution like this and you mirror it across a vertical axis, the variance doesn't change, but obviously the, the mean does. So despite knowing all these properties of variances, which I don't think have been described before, I still couldn't come up with an equation for, for describing these patterns a priori. Um, but I, I decided to just find them by brute force. So I, I went ahead and found the patterns for sample sizes five through 99. Uh, it's a little bit of a headache because of floating point errors, but um, powered through, made a web application for it. You just type in your, your mean, your standard deviation sample size, tell it if tell it what type of standard deviation you have, how you want it round, and it'll tell you if it's consistent or not. And I wrote it up as a preprint, like the like the Grim test. This is this is called the Grimmer test because it's more grim than the Grimm test. Um, I tried advertising it on Twitter and Reddit. I didn't really get that that many downloads. The, the main feedback I got was if I want people to care about this test, I have to show that it is actually useful to detecting fraud in the literature. It's not really easy to prove that a tool is useful in this regard because if you if you find mistakes in a publication, 
all the author has to do is say they were typos. How do you know? How do you know they were fraud? It was fraud. Um, so one thing you can do is if you have a suspicion that a paper is fabricated, then you would hope that this test would detect it. But I didn't really know where to find papers that were suspected of being fabricated. But then this blog post came along. Um, this PI started a new blog. He called it Pracademic. Here's help on how to get your PhD, get hired, and get tenure without making the same mistakes I did. And as the first post, he titled it The Grad Student Who Never Said No. This post is about two lab members, a postdoc who said no, and an unpaid foreign grad student who never said no. Let me just read some quotes. When she arrived, I gave her a data set of a self-funded failed study which had null results. I had three ideas for potential plan B, C, and D directions since plan A had failed. I told her what the analyses should be and what the table should look like. Every day she came back with puzzling new results. And every day we would scratch our heads, ask why, and come up with another way to reanalyze the data with yet another set of plausible hypotheses. This Turkish woman's resume will always have the five papers below. Four of those papers are from the same pizza buffet data set. Twitter was not happy with this blog post. People tweeted at uh, the PI, people commented on his blog, and he was very nice and agreed with what everyone said. And he wrote an addendum. Despite agreeing with people's concerns, he said that p-hacking shouldn't be confused with deep data dives. And then he ended the addendum with, what follows is a tale of two young researchers. All the criticism he just received was apparently just a small bump in the road for this <laughs> important tale of two researchers. I guess at this point he thought his problems were, were over. But unfortunately, I saw the blog post and tweet about it. I decided to go ahead and take a look at what these papers looked like. Here's, here's table two from one of the piece of papers. Just looking at this table, even without a calculator, you can tell that there are some problems. So when you have a sample size of 10 and you have whole numbers as your data, the only possible number you can have in the second decimal place is zero. So, so right away, there are some, some problems here. And then if you, if you go through the whole table, all these, all these numbers are mathematically impossible. So I, I showed this to Nick Brown and and he was surprised to say the least and we decided to move on to the next table i thought there was nothing to see here it's the same data as table two just the columns are, are arranged differently so here the first column is the same so so 2.63 2.63 2.06 2.06 but <laughs> Nick Brown pointed out that uh, some numbers are changing. For example, uh, 1.89, 1.88. These, these numbers should be the same. If you go through the entire table, all these numbers change between the two tables. And it's, it's the exact same table. It's the exact same data. This, this, was, this was confusing. This was hard to understand what's what's going on here. Um, Nick and I did not know what to think at this point. So it's interesting to think about what what would you do if you saw if you saw incompetence at this at this scale. 
would you would you do nothing um i mean you have other things to do <laughs> this isn't your problem um would you contact the journal tell them about these mistakes and hope that two years later they issue <laughs> a correction uh would you contact the authors hope that they reply to your email um, or would you go public with with what you had found? So when you when you find mistakes like this, you have to keep in mind that the person is a person. So his name is is Brian Wansick. He seems like a nice guy. He has a family. Going public with this information would obviously cause him a lot of problems and maybe affect his family. So. So there's repercussions to to revealing mistakes like this. And it's something to think about. So here here's what we did. To make an informed decision, we did some more research. We looked at all four pizza papers. There the number of problems in these pizza papers, I could I could go on and on. Every paper just has a litany of additional problems. It's not just granularity errors. It's impossible sample sizes. Um, they don't do metric conversions correctly. They they can't report degrees of freedom correctly. It's it's uh, it's a huge mess. Um, we contacted the authors, but we got no response. We contacted the lab. The first response they told us to go get our own data if we were interested in this study. <laughs> that was that was very friendly of them. Uh, we told them we just wanted to reanalyze their results, and then they told us there were some IRB issues. We explained we found some, some errors, and we simply want some anonymized data, and they wouldn't, they didn't respond to us. So we thought that Maybe the data was fabricated at this point, given the number of errors we saw and that the authors wouldn't give us the data. But we called the pizzeria and and apparently the study happened. So we, we got some more information. We got in contact with the person who found the blog post. The blog post was not found by accident. It was found by a researcher in Wansnick's field who is suspicious of a lot of Wansik's work, let's let's say that. Um, and he told us of, of various rumors that he's heard about about Wansik. Uh, we saw that Wansik's work has been criticized before. There was a couple blog posts out there. One person actually thought his work was an April Fool's joke. That's that's how silly that's how silly it was. Uh, we looked through the non pizza work by Wansik just in case these problems were limited to these publications since they they shared the grad student as an author so maybe the problems were just due to the grad student but uh, no the rest of his work has, has the same problems Grand, granularity errors and then i'm not a statistician but even i can see problems with the study, study designs and in the papers now this this really bothers me here's one of the pizza papers I've blogged about how useless citation counts are before. This one paper that was salami sliced from the data set, it has 14 self citations. He took, he took four, he took a, a failed study, published four papers and, and just self cited himself a bunch of times. This is, this is why I don't, I don't like citations as, as a metric. Um, we also couldn't help but notice that he has some conflicts of interest. McDonald's is one of his clients, private clients, and here's, here he is on Twitter. Here's a study that he did. <laughs> the conflict of interest statement from this publication is pretty amusing. No conflict of interest was declared. Dr. Wansink is a member of McDonald's Global Advisory Council. Okay then, that's interesting. If you go to his CV, you can see what funding he's received. A tofu company gave him a hundred grand. What did what did that get them? Got them this study. 
So at this point, I decided to go ahead and just start listing all the problems we had found. Here's the granularity errors for a single publication. Here's the test statistics errors for a single publication. Here's uh, some metric conversion problems for a single paper. Um, we knew going public with all these errors would cause a huge problem for the lab, but they admitted to questionable research practices. People have criticized their work before. We, we heard rumors about the lab. They displayed poor publication ethics by, self by numerous self-citations and by salami slicing in a failed data set. The number of errors indicates some of these might be fabricated. We, we don't know. Um, they wouldn't share their data. They stopped replying to our emails and they have conflicts of interest. So we posted the results as a preprint. We had a massive Twitter campaign to publicize the preprint. So it got downloaded 2,000 times on the first day. I was My phone was getting so many notifications, it, it vibrated off the table. When we posted the preprint, we, we notified the lab, but they didn't respond, of course. Um, people commented on PubPeer, I don't know who, um, but they didn't respond, the authors didn't respond to PubPeer. People tried to engage him on Twitter, he didn't respond to Twitter. Um, people commented on his blog, uh, he didn't respond on, on his blog. So so previously he had responded quickly to Twitter and, and blog comments, but it, it was clear that he was just trying to to ignore the problem. I wanted the the preprint to be the end of my involvement in this in this uh, story, but I didn't find this response acceptable, and neither did Nick Brown. Um, he severely underestimated us, so I started to contact all the journalists that I knew. Nick Brown contacted all the journalists that he knew, and after a journalist started uh, contacting Wontzik, he decided to start talking. He downplayed the problem to the journalists. He said there were some inconsistencies, there were minor inconsistencies. There's at least 150 mathematical errors in these papers. I don't, I don't know if I would consider that minor, minor inconsistencies or not. And he explained why the data could not be shared. He said it was tremendously proprietary. On PubPeer, he wrote that the data had identifying data, such as height and weight, and you could potentially use that to figure out who these people were. As ridiculous as that, that is, even if it were true, that's, that's a reason to not publicly share it, but it's not really a reason to not privately share the data. He posted a second addendum to his blog he did not mention our paper. He just said there were some, some minor problems and that a stats pro is redoing the, the analyses to fix the minor problems. He said that uh, we've always been pleased to be a group that's accurate to the third decimal point. That just doesn't make any sense because, well, that should be third decimal place and it doesn't make any sense in the context that <laughs> it's clearly just not true. Um, and then he again ended the addendum now back to our two students. So after having hundreds of errors in his publications revealed, it's just a small bump in the road to this important story about these, about these two students. So I decided to just go rogue at this point. I, I couldn't take it anymore. <laughs> so I, I posted a blog post about more problems I had found. He got pretty, pretty good attention. Uh, and then just to be safe, I followed it up with a, with another blog post. Um, we emailed the Office of Research Integrity asking for the data. They replied with a, a short response. We sent them a really long email, but we got a short response back. They said that Cornell allows its investigators to, to determine if and when it's appropriate to release raw data. We replied back, haven't gotten a response. It's been months. Um, 
We emailed the IRB, haven't got a response from them. Nick Brown decided to start getting in on the, the blogging action. And this resulted in one sick editing his second addendum. He he said that the the data will will be shared. He finally acknowledged our work and he admitted to being sloppy and that there's gonna be new standard operating procedures. This is a, a good response, but this is how you should respond. This is how he should have responded to our first email, not after multiple news articles and blog posts. And there are also some interesting uh, tidbits in this addendum. He said, when we finish these new SOPs, I hope to publish them. So this whole scandal is just another opportunity for another publication for this lab. And he mentioned in an interview with Retraction Watch that uh, some inconsistencies are just due to food fights and stolen apples. And this is this gained uh, this gained some traction on on Twitter. So I couldn't help but uh, write a blog post about that. Got got some attention. Uh, so Nick Nick Brown was noticing some some plagiarism, some self plagiarism also known as text recycling and came came across came across this two different studies by Wansick had the exact same results with the exception of this one value which looks like it's the it's a typo so 18 out of 18 values were basically the same this seemed to be the nail in the coffin you can't have two different studies get the same results. It's just not possible. Um, this this blog post made news around the world. The Netherlands covered it. Um, and at this point, Monsenik went into hiding. If you, when news news organizations contacted the lab, they they got a response from a PR firm that sent them to this this new statement. The statement read. A few new claims about my research have been made that are not quite as substantial. A master's thesis was intentionally expanded upon through a second study which offered more data that affirmed its findings with the same language, more participants, and the same results. So he's saying that they got the exact same results in two different studies. That's just, <laughs> that's just not possible. It's mathematically impossible for that to, to happen. Liar, liar, pants on fire. And he said that the self-plagiarism was simply him reemphasizing previous ideas. I should note that sometimes he just copied entire book chapters into another book. <laughs> the, the blog post mentioned five papers. Four of them were pizza papers. So what was this, this fifth paper that was in the blog post? It's this paper, and, and Nick Brown took a look at it. And he noticed that uh, apparently 20% of World War II U.S. combatants were female. That's, that's interesting. That's really interesting. I didn't know that. Um, this, this paper was, was based on what he calls the 2000 Veteran Survey. I thought I would go ahead and take a look and see whether papers were, were based on this, this survey. The first paper was published in 2008. There's nothing, there's nothing weird about collecting the uh, data in 2000 and the first paper coming out in 2008. And then 2009, another paper, 2011, a bunch of stuff, 2012, 2013, 2014. So just like the pizza data, which got salami sliced into four papers, this, this one data set got used in a bunch of, a bunch of publications. Although we published our paper on the, the pizza publications, we easily could have uh, focused on this data set instead. So we thought we landed the kill shot with the duplicated tables, but this guy is a, a zombie cereal slicer. And everyone knows that the second rule to, to zombies it's a double tap. So Nick Brown noticed that uh, when this lab does surveys, they always get 770 responses, regardless of how many people they survey. 
that's that's interesting. That's that's pretty amazing. Cornell hasn't uh, hasn't said anything about about this. So there's still there's still a lot to come with with this story. There's the journal responses. I've been contacting the journals involved to notify them of of the problems that could take time for them to respond. Cornell so far has said they're not going to investigate this case and they won't reply to our emails. I'm curious to see how long that will continue. And we continue to get contacted by journalists and large news organizations have been launching investigations. So Grimm didn't find Wansick. It made it really easy to, to notice that there were problems, but Wansick outed himself with his with his blog post. Um, so it's interesting to think. It, it was this just a huge? Did we just get really lucky with finding Wansick, or or are there a bunch of Wansinks out there? Can the search for Wansinks be automated? And can Grimm get better? Can we do even better than Grimm and Grimmer? So Grimm takes care of the means. Grimmer takes care of the standard deviations. So it only makes sense that Grimmist would take care of test statistics. We, we checked the test statistics in our preprint, but what we did is we found the range for the means and standard deviations because the means and standard deviations are rounded so you don't know the true value so you have to take into account this error and then with all these possibilities you can recalculate the ANOVA value but you can actually do better than this if the mean passes the Grimm test you know what the exact mean was you know this was the exact mean if the SD passes the Grimmer test, you know what the standard deviation was. You know what the standard deviation was. So then you could calculate what the exact ANOVA value was. And that's what Grimmist is. You figure out what the exact values were, and then you recalculate the test statistic. Grimm, Grimm is dumb. So if your data consists of numbers 1 through 9, and someone reports a mean of 0, 0.00. Obviously, you can't have a mean of 0 when the data is numbers 1 through 9, but Grimm doesn't know about that, so it would happily tell you this is consistent. They could even put in a negative number, and <laughs> Grimm doesn't know that numbers can't be negative, so that's consistent as well. But Sprite is smart. So what is Sprite? If you have if you have a mean and then you have an SD on a similar scale to the mean, and if you know the data can only be positive values, that might seem a little weird. And if you try and reconstruct what the data set might look like with that mean and that standard deviation, the maximum value for the reconstruction is going to have to be a large value. There's just no way around it. To get that large of a standard deviation, you're going to have to have at least one large value in the data set. Um, and if the data is number of carrots served to children, you might have some numbers which seem ridiculous. If you don't have the standard deviations, that's not really too much of a problem. Because you can back calculate standard deviations. So if you if you have sample sizes and means, but no standard deviation, but you have a test statistic, you can back calculate the standard deviation and get an estimate of what the standard deviation for the data set might have been. And then you can use Sprite to try and figure out what the data set looked like. And if the data set looks really weird, then that could be a concern. The thing with Sprite is is the values could be mathematically possible, but they look weird. So it's it's sort of a you have to you you have to visually inspect the distribution, and you also have to take into account what type of question was asked. For example, 
this might be a normal this might be perfectly normal if if you ask people a polarizing question for example do you like donald trump some people might really like him most people probably really don't like him so why why have we been focusing on psychology it's really it's really tempting to pick on psychology because the the standard operating procedure for psychology seems to be to come up, come up with some cool idea do some terrible study and then write some best-selling books on your results. But, but the real reason is we, we pick on psychology because there's small sample sizes and there's the data is usually whole numbers, which is great for granularity testing. But are there other fields that we can start to investigate? For example, mice studies have a small number of mice, so they could be a good a good area for this others cell counts for microscopy i'm trying to think of what, what others there, there could be what other applications for granular testing so this this whole story raise raises a bunch of questions how much evidence do you need to prove fraud at what point do you say we just need to call a spade a spade and say this researcher is fabricating data it's not clear how much evidence you need for that. And it's also not clear if fraud even matters. If 5% if of people are making up their data, you know, how much do, does that really matter? Most people are not making up their data. I think, I think it does matter because with how competitive funding is getting, if you notice that other people are cheating or suspect other people are cheating, that may now tempt you to start cheating. And as the environment gets more and more competitive, I think the chance of fraud only goes up. And if people know that they're not going to be caught, you know, why not? How, how does someone go undetected for 20 years publishing research like this? That's, that's a really interesting question to think about. It's not like he's published in only obscure journals. He's published in some very high quality journals in the past and, and no one has noticed any of these issues. It took us to come along to, to reveal these problems. And and what do you do if you suspect fraud? If, if, if someone reads a paper and they think the stats look suspicious, who do they, who do they call? If you see some scary stats, who do you call? You call the Ghostbusters. It's, it's interesting to think if you should have a team of people or, or something like the IRS or the FBI who get called in to investigate to investigate these these cases. And and the FBI, when they're trying to find a serial killer, they'll profile them to try and figure out who it is. I think it's it's not that hard to to profile uh, someone fabricating their data. If the data if the papers don't have data or code, that's that's a red flag. If they don't reply to emails, that's a red flag. If the PI has single author publications but he runs a huge lab, that's that's really interesting. He didn't collect the data himself. He didn't do the analyses. Why is he? Why is he single author on the papers? Where, where did the data and analyses come from? If they have a large number of papers, um, that, that's also a problem. I, I, I would maybe add large number of positive results. Because if you publish all your, all your results, and a lot of those are negative results, then that's, that's fine. And if they remind you of Trump, there's probably something weird going on. When he shared his blog post on Twitter back in November, this this was his tweet. He added fake academic stats, and this this blog post has recently been deleted. I'll just I'll just leave you with with this with this nugget.